And yeah, I, I sort of literally just walked in and said, Hey, I'm a physicist. I know some code. I know some math. Do you want me? <laughs> and, and okay, there was a few more interviews after that, but still that was like, you know, kind of my lucky break. Yeah. I, I would actually say that, um, like. Probably right now, I wouldn't suggest doing a PhD in, especially in machine learning. This is just an opinion, right? So maybe if you're listening to this, don't change your life plans, but just to give you some context, right? Doing a PhD is a pretty big commitment. It's typically four years, roughly, that you'll be committing to. And you have to really, 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 really like the, the subject because most of the time, the, the research questions that you work on are, are pretty hard to solve because if they were easy, right, I mean, you would do them in your master thesis or something. And to get through those moments where you basically don't know how to solve what you're doing and maybe not solving that problem could take you months and maybe even longer, you need to be really, really like sure that you want to do that. Welcome to the Richmond Alake podcast. This week, we are speaking with Lewis Tunstall. The conversation I had with Lewis was very interesting and very enlightening and showed me how someone of a research background can transition into applied machine learning. Interestingly enough, Lewis actually holds a PhD in theoretical particle physics and has contributed to the scientific community in the understanding of dark matter. But currently, Lewis is a machine learning engineer at Hogging Face and is also one of the authors of the widely popular book, Natural Language Processing with Transformers. In our conversation, Lewis shares how he transitioned from physics to machine learning. He also talks about how he got his first data science role, which was by pure chance. And we also get an insight into the story behind the book. So, I'm Richmond Alake, a machine learning practitioner exploring the humans behind AI and data one person at a time. I hope you enjoy this conversation and come away a better practitioner. Hi, Lewis. Thanks for joining me today. You've recently published your book, Natural Language Processing with Transformers. I want to have a couple of questions. I want to unpack a couple of things. But the first question I want to ask is, what was your mo motivation for writing this book? Yeah, thank you very much for having me, Richmond. That's a really great question. I think the, the simple answer was frustration. So when I started out with Transformers and NLP, this was, I think, around early 2019. So for those who maybe don't know the history, like the Transformer was introduced in 2017 for machine translation. And then BERT came around in, I think, late 2018. And kind of that's when the sort of revolution took off. And so my first encounter was with BERT for a question answering project I was working on at the former startup. And I remember at the time, like there wasn't even a Transformers library. It was actually called, I think, PyTorch pre-trained BERT. And it was like basically a port of the TensorFlow code to, to PyTorch. And it had a couple of scripts, but it had nothing else. I mean, it was like, you know, really raw. You had to do a lot of your own digging into the library to sort of understand how things worked. And I was also new to NLP. So I had been working as a data scientist in time series and other domains. And this was my kind of first NLP project. And I was really confused. Basically, I remember looking inside the transformer and going, well, I have no idea what's going on here. And at the time, it's only a couple of years ago, but basically there were only like, like Jay Alamar's blog posts and, um, Sasha Rush had this awesome annotated transformer, um, where he just goes through the, um, the original transformer. And I thought to myself, well, if I'm kind of in industry and I'm a bit struggling to understand what's going on here, maybe there's other people in my shoes. And so as I started getting a couple of projects under my belt, I thought it'd be kind of cool to write a book about the things that I had learned. And um, yeah, by kind of pure luck, I had a really good friend who was also in the same boat and the same feeling. And we said, let's partner up. And uh, yeah, we then kind of cold emailed Tom Wolf at Hugging Face and just said, hey, we're writing a book. Would you like to be part of it? And I was thinking like, no way is Tom going to respond to this cold email. But to my great surprise, he said yes. And one and a half years later, here we are. That is a great background story into it. And I guess the, the blog post that explained Transformers to you very well is essentially what your book is to me. Because when I wanted to learn about Transformers, I picked up your book. And just a few pages, I just 
understood what Transformers was and I went into the practical aspect of it, aspect of it using the Hugging Face library. And you're currently a machine learning engineer at Hugging Face right now. That's right. So in a way you could say the book was the longest job interview of my life. <laughs> no, no. So, so it's kind of a funny thing, right? Like when we started thinking of this book with Leandro, we had no ambitions of working at Hugging Face in that sense. We were working in Switzerland in our own different companies. And I think the pandemic really changed the scene. So at that time, I think to join Hugging Face, you had to move to Paris or to New York. And that wasn't really a, an option for either of us. And once things started going really remote, then this became a kind of possibility. And the book was just like a sort of serendipitous entry to meeting Tom and the rest of the team and so on. So yeah, I, I never expected it would end up this way. And uh, yeah, there we are. I was going to ask you what benefits are you getting from writing this book? I guess you've answered that. Are there any other additional benefits that have come about from writing this book? Yeah. So there's a couple of things that really shocked me when we, when I was writing this. So the first one was several people reached out to us through social media who were for me, kind of my intellectual heroes. I actually learned machine learning from Aurelien Geron's hands-on ML book, uh, uh, which is classic. Yeah, exactly. I'm not right behind me. <laughs> exactly. And, and, and this is like, this was for me the first ML book that I really kind of got because up until then I had been trying to do things more like at the university formal level and there are always like tons of theory and tons of unnecessary details and his book is really great at just, you know, getting to the point. And so he reached out to us and said, hey, I saw you have this like book coming out. Can I review a few chapters? And I was like, oh my God. <laughs> and yeah, he gave us like this amazing feedback, which really improved the final version, but it was also a chance to in a way meet some of your heroes. And um, then later down the track, this got us also in touch with Jeremy Howard, who the, you know, the fast AI course had a huge impact on my career. So in a way, just, yeah, writing this, this book on this topic has given me kind of a chance to meet electronically several um, people who I admire. And I think the other thing that's been really interesting is like learning how to write is like a kind of evolving process. So if I look at my very early drafts of the chapters to how they ended up, I can see there was a really big improvement as we went along because all of us were first time authors. And when you write, you're trying to figure out like, who am I talking to and what is like an example that is going to hopefully make sense. And this whole experience for me was like really like interesting and, you know, novel. I had never really gone through this whole process of writing 400 pages of, um, of text. Are you going to write a novel book? Like, is there going to be a future edition or are you, or has it just put you off just a process? <laughs> yeah. So I think it depends when you ask me. So if you had asked me just before we, we sent the final version, I probably would have said, I don't want to look at it anymore. Like my eyes were bleeding and. We had gone through this like intense phase. We had like two week kind of, let's say hackathon of just finishing all these loose ends. And if you look at the Git commit history on our repository, it's a big spike of, of changes in the last uh, two weeks. But yeah, now that it's out, like I feel really, really good about it. And as for a future, I think there will probably have to be a second edition because the field moves way too quick at the moment. So. I was quite concerned when we started this, that it would be outdated by the time we released it because Transformers are only now around three to four years old, but you, you never know, right? I mean, something could have come and then just completely changed the landscape. If something changes, I think one interesting aspect in Transformers right now is the branching out into new domains. So we have a final chapter in the book, which talks about applications to vision and speech and tables. And I could imagine that in the future edition, we might consider having a really dedicated chapter on, for example, vision or something like this, because I think this is quite exciting right now. I think that's what led me to exploring Transformers is just the application from a computer vision perspective. I work as a computer vision engineer and mm -hmm. I've just been seeing gradually the progression of the utilization of um, Transformers for computer vision tasks. And uh, there's... But, We've spoken about Transformers a bit, mentioned it a bit, but could you, in layman terms, just explain what a Transformer is? Yeah, sure. So um, a Transformer is a neural network, which is especially like suited for processing sequential data. So this is data that could be, for example, like a time series, but it could also be language, which kind of is like a sequence of words, but it could even be like a sequence of genes or, you know, 
proteins, which you may have also heard of things like AlphaFold2 kind of being built on top of a transformer. And the, the kind of really novel part of this is that in, if you think about any sort of sequence of information, you often need to have some kind of context about the ordering of the words and in particular, how different words influence others. So if I give you a sentence, like, <clears throat> uh, I don't know, um, the, the, the brown fly ate a banana, then I would like to know what is the relationship, for example, between banana and fly. And as a human, we read this kind of sentence and we say, oh, there's some sort of relationships between these words. And in the transformer, there's a mechanism called the self-attention mechanism. And this mechanism basically allows the representations that we create of these words to have some kind of contextual information. So we can learn basically from the, from the training process that the word fly is probably related to banana in that particular example. And yeah, that's a very sort of uh, high level summary. I think what goes on top of this, which is not often mentioned so much is that there's a concept called transfer learning. And this is almost as important, if not more important than the actual transformer architecture. And the idea here is that most of the time, like until recently, we used to train our neural networks from scratch. So we would basically um, have a data set and then we would just train. And then at the end of that, we would say, okay, I've got my model. Now I'm going to deploy it and see if it, you know, generalizes in the real world. And, um, the problem with that is that one, you need lots of data usually, and two, you, you have this problem that you have to train lots of different models for different data sets and it becomes a bit unwieldy. So a big revolution actually started in, in computer vision was the idea of doing transfer learning where you train a model on a huge data set like ImageNet, and then you take this model, which has learned some kind of deep features of images like edges and things like this. And then you take that kind of information, which is stored in the network and you then adapt it to a different data set and even a different task, potentially. You could even think of just changing the, the sort of application or the, the outputs. And until recently, that wasn't really possible for NLP because language is weird and not so structured as images. And the big breakthrough from my reading of the history was that basically Jeremy Howard and Sebastian Ruder, they figured out with the sort of paper or model called ULM fit, how you can do this really effectively for text classification. And then this kind of really inspired then the application of this technique with the transformer architecture, which led to sort of where we are um, today. You do a very good job of just giving an understanding of transformers. And I guess that's because you provide a lot of educated material on YouTube. I've seen a lot of videos and on deep learning AI as, as well. Mm -hmm. So I would like to talk about your education background. You actually studied theoretical physics. And quantum theories. So I, I, when I looked at your background, I was quite shocked to see how someone that's studied physics, quantum theory has moved into machine learning. So could you unpack that? Yeah, sure. So I think this wasn't planned by any means. When I was studying at university, I was very much in love with physics and mathematics. And this kind of led me down the sort of standard academic path where you, you finish a bachelor, you do a PhD. And I actually came to Switzerland uh, to do a postdoc. And in this postdoc, I was um, exposed to colleagues who were working at the Large Hadron Collider. And in particular, this is like a, an experiment, which is colliding protons at really high energies. And uh, one of my friends, he, he was an experimentalist who was analyzing the data from the, these experiments. One of the things that like physicists like to do is they like to develop ways of discriminating between the physics we know and the physics we maybe don't know. And the idea here is that you want to discover something new and that something new is hopefully some sort of new particle. So you may have heard of the Higgs boson, which was discovered at the LHC. This was a sort of new discovery that hadn't been made before. And the way that physicists traditionally do this is they develop, you can think of them as features, like kind of like machine learning features, but they're kind of handcrafted, right? So they're, they're based on like a lot of deep theory and a lot of deep thinking about what kind of things could we do to that would unravel the background from the signal. And uh, my friend, he, he said, oh, Lewis, check this out. I've got a Python script, which basically beats all like the physicists at the moment in the world. And, you know, it does it in like about an hour. And I was like, what? <laughs> and I went and checked out his thing. And it was this like TensorFlow one code, you know, from the good old days where, you know, everything was really, you know, complicated. But it was amazing. I mean, basically he, he was getting like kind of state of the art results at discriminating the background from the um, signal. 
And I thought, okay, there's some sort of something special happening here, right? Like you've got this like kind of very simple thing, maybe a hundred lines of code and it's beating or outperforming 20 years of hard work. And what actually got me into the field was a Kaggle competition. So this uh, friend of mine said, Hey, I'm thinking of switching out of academia. And one way to sort of prove ourselves is maybe on Kaggle. So we entered a Kaggle competition and first time ever had no idea what we were doing. We, we learned to XG boost because in those days, Kaggle still was in tables and yeah, that kind of got me hooked and I did a few more Kaggle competitions and then I thought, okay, I'm having a lot of fun training models and the academic path is quite an uncertain path where you don't know where you live. You don't know where, you know, cause every few years you have to move. And yeah, I thought, okay, there's a great option to switch fields now. And I jumped aboard and started working at a startup. The startup is in Switzerland. They're still around called Spout. And they were really focused on, and they still are on real time stream processing. So the, the idea here is if you've ever heard of things like Kafka, it's like a different way of processing data at scale, but also with low latency. And my job there was, let's say by title data scientist. But the reality, I think every data scientist experiences is that there's this like very messy side of things, which is basically, let's say data engineering or even software engineering. And so I actually didn't train a single model for like maybe a year at the, at my, at the startup, but I learned a huge amount about data engineering and how you have to think about systems, distributed systems at scale, which was a really, really cool experience. And I think that really helped set my kind of foundation for what came next, because most of ML engineering is actually more like software engineering. And so I think if you have more of the software skills, it really helps you when you have to actually then apply and make things really work. If you're a software engineer, you can have some skills transferred to machine learning. Are there any skills that you've transferred from your academic um, background into your career as a machine learning engineer? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. I think it's, it's hard to know exactly because for example, I was expecting when I switched fields that there would be like a lot of mathematics, because if you look at any sort of, let's say university course on ML, there's like often a lot of equations about back propagation and stuff like this. Yeah. And then in, the reality is actually, at least from my experience, there is very little mathematics actually used in like industrial ML, which is, I think a good thing because you, you don't necessarily have to you know, derive all these gradients by hand. So I didn't really get a chance to use any of the maths that I had, you know, spent all this time learning in physics. But the thing that I, that I found did transfer quite well was perhaps some um, problem solving. So a lot of the time in physics and especially in research, you, you have a lot of uncertainty about your ideas and a lot of uncertainty about how to even define a certain problem. And the usual way that you do this is you figure out how to break it down into like certain chunks. So if you're trying to, for example, do a very complicated calculation in quantum mechanics or quantum field theory, which is what we usually use, then you have to find strategies to break this kind of very, very complicated thing into manageable bytes. And that really helped me a lot when I was starting out in ML, because most ML projects have the same problem, right? You have this complex mix of business demands, performance metrics, actually implementing the code and all that kind of stuff. So. I would say that's probably the main thing that transferred, but I don't know. It, it, it depends, I think, on where you end up. Some of my friends, they went into finance and I think there it's very much more mathematical than the general sc scope of ML. In their case, they got to reuse all the maths. There was one thing I was going to ask is in you have a PhD and has that actually helped you get your current career as a machine learning engineer or as a data scientist, did that actually help you? Yeah, that's a really interesting one. I would say the answer is mixed because when I started out, I actually got rejected like a lot of times because I had a PhD. So I was applying to various companies and they would say, oh, your profile looks a bit too academic. And we've got some candidates who already have some like real world experience or industrial experience. And another comment I got in one of my rejection letters was I'm a bit concerned about hiring a PhD because you are someone who has devoted like 10 years of your life to a single kind of subject. And I'm worried that if I hire you, you're going to be super depressed doing SQL queries or something like that. So I would say at the start, it was a sort of negative thing maybe, but 
later, I think it helped when I was applying for new jobs, because when you combine it with industrial experience, then you've got the best of both worlds where at least on paper, you've got some credentials and you've also got some experience. I'm not sure exactly if I can say one way or another, you know, it yeah. definitely helped. Is in you wouldn't, as in if someone wants to come to you and just say, okay, should I take a PhD in, in machine learning or something related to get a job? What advice would you say, would you give them? Yeah, I, I would actually say that, um, like probably right now, I wouldn't suggest doing a PhD in, especially in machine learning. This is just an opinion, right? So maybe if you're listening to this, don't change your life plans, but just to give you some context, right? Doing a PhD is a pretty big commitment. It's typically four years, roughly, that you'll be committing to. And you have to really, 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 really like the, the subject because most of the time, the, the research questions that you work on are, are pretty hard to solve because if they were easy, right? I mean, you would do them in your master thesis or something. And to get through those moments where you basically don't know how to solve what you're doing and maybe not solving that problem could take you months and maybe even longer. You need to be really, really like sure that you want to do that. And the other thing is that in ML, the, the field is moving so fast right now that I think that doing a PhD for say four years might lead to a problem where at the end, the work that you did maybe is out of date or not so trendy. I mean, unfortunately the field is driven by fads and trends and if you want to then pursue like a kind of industrial career afterwards, you might ask yourself whether you could have spent those four years just doing real world ML and learning all the like useful stuff. And then in your side time, picking up the research parts that interest you. I did a research and what I found out was a lot of people for job roles have PhD degrees. At least a master's is pretty much the bare minimum. I have to have a master's, master's degree, maybe not a PhD, but I need to fork out some money to get a master's degree. Do you have any opinions on master's? It's shorter, one year. Like in the old days, right? You went to university, you got your degree, and then that was like a piece of paper that basically qualified you for the workforce. And I think that kind of method or that model is not really true nowadays. And you can kind of shortcut it. And I think the master could be worth it, but I wouldn't think of it as a necessary requirement because Again, in the master, you're doing some research projects and the question is whether those research projects are directly relevant for, you know, what you want to do next. So if you want to have a research career, then sure, definitely do a master. But if you want to get into industry, I actually think the most effective way of doing this is to really work in public and work in the open. And what I mean by that is basically build either libraries or contribute to libraries in like the open source domain, if you're really into that part of, of the field, because this will one teach you lots of useful skills, but it will also give you visibility that I think everyone in the field will understand. So for example, imagine that I, I did my master thesis on some topic, then the person who's reading my application has to have some sort of interest in that topic to go, okay, they have a master, blah, blah, blah. But if you say, oh, you know, I've been like a core contributor to scikit-learn you know, for whatever, how much time or a core contributor to PyTorch or whatever library you think of, I think practitioners in the field respect that because they know, like I use this tool every day and, and you can check it, right? You can visibly check, oh, this person has made all these different commits or features or whatever. But of course I'm super biased because I'm talking to you from an open source uh, perspective, but I, I, I feel like that's one way of shortcutting the, the prestige barrier or the credentials barrier. You mentioned visibility and a lot of what you were talking about, like contributing to open source libraries, it takes a high level of confidence to feel like you can. Do you have any tips for how to sort of get through the barrier? Yeah, yeah. That's, that's really like great question because my like first open source contribution, I'm trying to think, what was it? I think it was it, when I was working in a company and I had to fix a bug on um, one of the libraries we were using. And I remember being quite scared because you have now publicly say, Hey, I think there's a bug in your code. Here's a pull request to fix it. And in that particular case, what helped was that it was part of my job in the sense that I had to just do it. I couldn't say no, but later what I found was really effective is actually having a friend on a project and, and working together on something this way. What I'm talking about is like uh, Leandro and I, we, at one point we decided to re-implement one of DeepMind's papers on uh, mathematical reasoning and 
this was like an, just a little side project uh, we did in the summer. And in the process of doing that, you, you discover that there are some like issues or limitations that we were um, dealing with TensorFlow. And this then prompted us to start thinking about, okay, how could we improve this? And then ultimately in this case, we actually switched to PyTorch, but it was something that we could have then used as a way of like saying, okay, let's open some issues and let's maybe try to make it better. And if there's two people, then at least you feel a bit more confident that you're on the right path. But yeah, the other like practical advice is most open source libraries often have a kind of good first issue tag or a kind of easy tag. And these are things that are like usually around improving documentation, improving like examples or tutorials. And I think this is maybe like the way to start. If you're just trying to find a way, you know, how do I contribute? This is a great way because everyone appreciates good examples and good documentation, but unfortunately they don't get the priority that they probably deserve. In terms of visibility, one thing you've done is you've written a book and pretty much made you visible in the entire machine learning field. Would you advise a practitioner to aspire to write a book? Would that be like an advice you would give in terms of increasing your visibility while you're in a career or trying to get into? Yeah, I think in this case, definitely it, it's, it's worked out that way. The reason I'm a bit hesitant to maybe recommend it as a general rule, um, is that the book is, it's writing a book is again, really, really, really hard. <laughs> and, and you're probably going to find that with your book. And the reason it's hard is because it's a long project that you're often doing on the side, right? So you're maybe working full time and you're having to do this in the evenings and the weekends. And that requires a fair amount of sacrifice from not yourself, but also your partner or your friends and your family, because you suddenly you just disappear for most of the time. So I think it can work out this way, but it's kind of, again, a, a trade-off of how much sacrifice you're willing to put in to get it out. And the other thing is that you're not necessarily guaranteed like high visibility, unless you're lucky to pick the, maybe the right topic at the right time. And in this case, we were just, I think, quite lucky that transformers are quite an exciting um, field at the moment. But if I had written a book about, I don't know, support vector machines, probably no one would buy it because they're kind of like out of date. So I think it's like a, a bit of a mix of being strategic about what the domain and the topic is, and then ideally having the, the time to commit to it. He's talking about transformers being so like a hot topic and everyone's focusing on it now. I want to get your opinion. Do you think transformers would be the go-to architecture for solving vision problems as opposed to convolutional neural networks? Just want to get your opinion on that. <laughs> so I'm not willing to, to predict or put any money on this yet because I, I think it's still like a, a bit of an open question. So just for the record, I'm not a computer vision expert. I, I work mostly on NLP and most of what I'm going you know, to tell you now is based on reading some papers and mostly Twitter. From what I understand right now, vision transformers can kind of compete with ResNets in terms of like performance on ImageNet, but they struggle in a couple of areas. So one is the computational cost for training or pre-training from what I've seen tends to be significantly more than ResNets. And the other aspect is that they seem to be a bit more fiddly in the hyperparameters that you need to use for pre-training. It seems that like you have to have the resources to do some search and hyperparameter space across ImageNet, which is not so easy. But I, I have seen recently, there's, there's an interesting paper which shows that if you change the loss term from the standard cross entropy loss to a sort of special thing called, I think it's called the SAM loss, or it's like a kind of regularized loss term, which tries to sort of minimize your loss in neighborhoods in the okay. loss landscape instead of just directly on, on, on lines. And this claims to then solve some of the problems I said, um, or I mentioned. So my kind of rough forecast would be that I think vision transformers will probably become like more mainstream as these kind of early problems are solved. Um, but I don't know, you're the computer vision expert. I mean, do you, is, is the community like super enamored with, is it like resonance for life or, you know, like <laughs> something? One thing that has drew me to transformers again, is something that I just sort of like tuned out, not tuned out, but didn't pay much attention to until maybe late last year, just with the amount of mention in newsletters and again, research papers that were coming out and again, Twitter, um, which was just drove me to actually explore this topic and take it more seriously. But I do, there is one, I forgot who mentioned this. I think it was Andre Kapathi. He mentioned that there's going to be 
a convergence to uh, just one architecture that solves mm -hmm. pretty much the whole of problems within machine learning or largely AI. And now we have two architectures for solving vision problems. So I just, I, that's how I was just thinking, is, is it tra is Transformers going to be the architecture? Because what really drove deep learning and made the field popular was convolutional neural networks and, um, and training them on GPUs. But are we moving away from that now? Again, it's too early to say, right? Um, it's still the early days. That's true. I, I think one interesting direction here is OpenAI and DeepMind have been pushing really strongly in multimodal applications. So the idea is, imagine I have a text and image pair, and this could be something like an image with a caption. What OpenAI showed is that if you basically take a standard transformer, again, it's kind of like a GPT style um, transformer, and you do some contrastive learning on that, you can actually get really, really good at like generating images, for example, from text descriptions. So you can say like, I think they have a really funny one. It's like a capybara in a bath or something. And, you know, the, the model then generates the, the image of this, uh, this animal. And the same thing on the deep mind side is they've really done some great work with the perceiver, which is a special type of transformer, which can simultaneously process, um, audio text and images. So this is kind of showing that there's like a, a future where, as you say, maybe there is just one kind of backbone architecture, which is like a transformer. And then the question is just how do you combine these different modalities to build a kind of more general purpose system? Because I, I think convnets by themselves may struggle, you know, to, to, to kind of accommodate these multimodal um, domains. And it seems that transformers are sufficiently general, um, but that, that, that seems to be possible. I want to tap into your sort of like machine learning career and I want to understand what does a day to day look like? What does a normal day look like for you as a machine learning engineer at Hogging Face? Yeah, sure. I, I think this is probably not the normal thing because it's very like uh, driven by open source, more or less like the day to day revolves around the transformers library. So at the moment, what I'm especially focused on is there's a special format called ONNX, which is used for essentially exporting deep learning models into a kind of agnostic or framework agnostic um, format. And then you can deploy that special ONNX model on different hardware, on different accelerators. You can even take a PyTorch model and then convert it to TensorFlow. It offers this very flexible deployment strategy. And what I've been working on is providing that conversion from transform models into this um, format. And most of the day is like around, let's say writing code. So you have a feature that's usually requested from the community and then you, you implement it. And then the other part of my job is more around education. So one of the things that I'm very passionate about is trying to help as many kind of people as possible have a kind of entry into this field, because at least Personally, it really, you know, changed my life for the better. And it'd be nice to be able to share that knowledge and help other people in the same boat. So we actually have a course called the Huggy Face course, and this is in, in, in continual development. And uh, right now I'm working with, um, with the team to bring out the next chapter, which will be all about machine learning demos and how to share your models with interactive UIs. Can you provide insight into what your tech stack? looks like as an NLP engineer? Sure. So again, it's basically driven by whatever the open source libraries we use. So um, most of what I work in today is PyTorch. And then around PyTorch, you have a, a whole ecosystem of Pythonic type tools. For example, all of our testing is done in PyTest. We use various formatters and stuff, which are maybe not so interesting, but yeah, basically it's, it's PyTorch, Python, and <clears throat> sometimes I do some other work, which is more about evaluation and, and how can we host like benchmarks on, on the Huggy Pace Hub. And then this gets you a little bit more into the territory of like deployment. And then you have to start thinking about maybe Kubernetes and stuff like that. But that tends to be a small slice of, of the day. And it's, it's basically, yeah, PyTorch and then everything else on top of that. Okay. You're pretty much into education and I think you've mentioned maybe mentorship. And you work in startup, but I also saw you actually are a mentor at Oyst AI. Am I saying that correctly? Yep. Um, what is, what is Oyst AI? Yeah. So this is like a an sort of incubator slash accelerator in Australia. It was founded by a few guys who wanted to help the Australian startup scene 
get a bit of a boost in the direction of let's say responsible applications of AI. So in Australia, things are getting better now, but for a long time, it was a wasteland when it came to startups. Most people in tech, they would leave for the US or for Europe. And so what these guys are trying to do is change that. And it has this like special focus on trying to avoid sponsoring or funding things that lead to harm. And specifically what I do is some of these startups, they, they have like ideas because they're very early stage. They say, Hey, we have an idea about applying, I don't know, computer vision or NLP to this type of problem. And then me and other people provide some kind of input to help them get on the right track, so to speak. Okay. And what, I guess. I understand the benefit for the startups and uh, the accelerator. What do you get out of it? What was the benefit for you? Just actually nothing, I would say, except giving back. In my career, I've benefited greatly from random acts of kindness, so to speak. So yeah. people who took the time out of their day, especially like mentors, right? Like when I started my industrial career, one of the software engineers at the first startup I worked at, he took a lot of his time to sit down with me and say, hey, this is how we write tests. This is how we, you know, deploy things. This is how you, you know, write Java, which you've never seen before, this kind of stuff. And that had a big impact on, on my way of thinking that when this happens to you, it's nice to be able to give it back in, in some small way. And so there's no, uh, let's say, there's nothing else beyond that um, in this particular case. Is it, I want to get your opinion on one matter, and that is boot camps and certifications. Where do you stand on using it as a method of getting into a machine learning industry? Yeah, that, that's a, I think a slightly tricky one because I've actually done some of these certifications. I did the deep learning.ai course, which on deep learning, which is great. Actually, it's got Andrew and, yeah. you know, he's giving us really nice lectures. And in that particular case, the setup they had was that you basically paid, I think like a kind of monthly fee. And when you completed all of the modules, you then got the certificate. And the motivation there for me was to finish because you're paying for it. So you have a kind of commitment to really getting through it, which was quite useful. But as for the actual certificate, then helping in, in some direct way, it's pretty hard for me to know if, if it actually worked because I never was asked about this in any interview I ever had. No one said, oh, you did this deep learning AI thing. And more people were more interested in the actual projects, you know, that, that I had worked on. So I think the certificates and the courses can be a good way to maybe commit yourself to getting something done because you've got skin in the game. But if I was doing my time again, I probably would just recommend if people are really specifically interested in deep learning, I would just recommend you do the fast AI course because this course for me was a different way of thinking where. Jeremy Howard really emphasizes like practical stuff. And there's all these gems of software engineering tricks and hacks, which I still use today, which are kind of just littered throughout this whole course. And it also shows you like how to get really good results fast. And he shows you, let's say best practices in machine learning. And so my recommendation would probably be to start there and then build something using what you've learned, because again, that, that can get you in the direction of having some visibility that you've done something and you can point people to it. Whereas if you've just got like a certification, maybe it's a bit hard like for people to say, hey, was it just some multiple choice questions or was it actually hard? I was going to ask you this earlier. You spoke a lot about the rejections you had when you were trying to break into the field. And I don't know how many rejections you had, but at some point you probably think, oh wait, Maybe I should start. What kept you going and how, how did you deal with um, the rejections? Yeah, that was actually a pretty tough time, I would say, in my life because I was also leaving a field which I was, let's say, heavily or emotionally attached to because when you've spent roughly 10 years of your life working on a topic, at some point you've been married to it. And so in this case, I, I remember something that gave me a, a very positive boost was Deloitte had a hackathon and in this hackathon, it was a recruit, like a recruitment type event, but basically you had to work with complete strangers at solving a kind of loosely defined data science problem. And what was really cool here was even though I didn't get recruited or I didn't get a job, I actually learned like a lot of things from the people around me in, in this team, which then led to kind of network effect where someone was like, oh, hey. There are these other jobs in these other places I know of, maybe you can apply there. And 
at the end of the day, I got my job. I think I was rejected probably maybe, let's say from 20 to 30 jobs at the start when I was trying to break into the field and actually getting my first job again was random. My wife was walking past the street and she said, oh, I think there's a startup setting up shop down the road. You should have a chat with them. And I was thinking, ah, oh, you know, as if I'm going to just, you know, randomly walk into this place and say, hey, do you want to hire me? I felt compelled. I was kind of maybe a little bit, you know, thinking there's not many other options. So let's see what happens. And yeah, I, I sort of literally just walked in and said, hey, I'm a physicist. I know some code. I know some math. Do you want me? <laughs> and, and okay, there was a few more interviews after that, but still, that was like, you know, kind of my lucky break. And I would say my personal experience has generally been just one of a lot of luck and maybe also just being like, as you say, persevering. So I, I probably could have quit and said, okay, I'm just going to stay in academia and do something, you know, just move country and do other things. But in this case, it was just waiting out just long enough that then an opportunity arose. But I, I don't know how to help people say how long you should wait for, or how do you get these opportunities? It was yeah, just a bit of random luck. I don't really have much reference, but I think 20 to 30 rejections is a lot. <laughs> it, it's, it, it feels, it sounds like a lot. And it depends, it depends on what stage as well. Cause if you're like in the final stages and you've done all this work, then you were to get rejected. It was just, but you're right. Like perseverance. So you never know what works. Just walking into a startup and just like, Hey. <laughs> yeah. And, and it's a really tricky thing because I remember when I was in high school, I was working in like, I think at KFC or something. And I remember when I first applied, it was a thing where like you needed to have experience to get the job. And it's, yeah, but if you're like a high school kid, how do you have any experience? <laughs> and in the end, I got the job because a friend worked there and said, just hire him. And then, you know, I mean, it was, it was like my first thing, but I think the whole world works that way. Right. So like once you're in the industry, meeting other people often leads to these like kind of serendipitous effects where someone is like, Hey, um, you know, I'm starting a new company or, you know, there's yeah. an open position here. Would you like to join? And it's completely off the radar, right? I mean, you don't see it any, it's not advertised anywhere. It's just kind of word of mouth. Um, so yeah, I think. I just want to say, you've got some awesome friends in your life, man, because every single point that we've spoken about, there's always a friend. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I think it's like a little bit like, um, you, you never know w where things will go. Right. And a lot of the time, like you make friends with people from different walks of life and it's kind of, yeah, if you have enough like nodes in your network, some of these nodes will, you know, fire when, when you need them. Exactly. There was this saying that I was trying to like put together, I'm going to put it in my book and it's the, the, the networking within machine learning or any sort of like tech field is not who knows you, but who knows, you know, what, you know, if that really? makes sense. And I was like, okay, like you need to tell people, look, Hey, I know these things as opposed to you just networking normally, you just network with your work essentially. Um, but yeah, I don't know if that's someone that's already made that saying up for, I'm claiming it, claiming it. So yeah, go for it. You had a hair it, it, it can be the subtitle of your book, right? <laughs> I was trying to pick up a, a tagline for mine. Um, it's hard. It's hard. And then I guess we can, I guess the title of your book was pretty straightforward, but was there any other alternative you were, titles you were playing with? Um, yeah, I think it was actually pretty defined from the early days. I have a Slack message with Leandro where I say, oh, you know, I, this is like very, like literally like the first week we said we're going to do it. And I say something like, oh, I reckon the book should be called NLP with Transformers. And Leandra's, and I, and I said, and I said, oh yeah, and there should be like a picture of Optimus Prime on the front cover. And um, Leandra's like, or it could be a picture of you in Optimus Prime boxer shorts. <laughs> and I, I, you know, I kind of screenshotted this, uh, this uh, message for, for, um, you know, the future. And it turns out we almost have, you know, well, we have the title, but we don't have, you know, me in boxer shorts. Yeah. I've been being published on a writing to do the bad thing. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. But yeah. Did you, did you try to negotiate just have it there? Not the picture of you in the boxes, but they're <laughs> transforming this one. <laughs> yeah. So we, we, it's really interesting. O'Reilly has a kind of like top secret way of how they generate the, the animals, right? So they told us they can't tell us in advance which animal it will be and you know why, but apparently an illustrator kind of, I think looks through the book and then tries to sort of channel 
you know, an, an, an animal out of it. And in our case, we got a parrot, which is pretty interesting because parrots have kind of two roles in NLP today. One is this thing called stochastic parrots, um, which I don't know if you've heard of this quite famous paper now by um, Meg Mitchell and um, others, which was exploring the idea that like most of these language models that um, we train in, with transformers, they're not really understanding in the kind of human way of understanding. They're just learning how to like memorize and how to basically parrot things that look really convincing, but deep down they're just shallow. In the book itself, in the final chapter, we train a GPT-2 scale model from scratch for code. And so this is like a, an idea of trying to replicate like OpenAI's Codex model or GitHub Copilot. And uh, Tom, who, who drafted that chapter, he decided to call the model Code Parrot. Because again, it's kind of like, you know, you're parroting um, code. And I, I don't know if the illustrator read that, um, but they picked a parrot, which I think is a pretty nice and accurate way of describing, you know, transformers. So at first, when you first mentioned that they have someone to sort of like channel the book, I was like, wow, that sounds like some, some mystical stuff. <laughs> At the end of it, I'm like, oh wait, maybe it does work. <laughs> yeah. But then you have to ask yourself like, what, why does like Aurelian Geron's book have a lizard on it? So I don't know. It's a, it's a thing where may, maybe it's not, maybe, or maybe I'm just making it up, but at least they told us that. Is, I think that's all the questions I have today. This is a very awesome conversation. Thank you for coming on to the podcast. Before we go, do you have any last shout outs or advice or tips? Yeah. So first, thank you very much for having me. It was a really nice chat we had. I would say like the, the last tips, which I was maybe a bit slow to pick up on is as much as people may hate social media, Twitter is currently one of the like best mediums to stay up to date on machine learning research and in particular kind of what trends are happening in the field. I, I think if you try to figure out what's happening by reading the literature, you have a very, very tough time because there's thousands of papers every day being published. Twitter gives you a pretty nice kind of funnel um, into what's currently happening. So I resisted this for like many years. But now I'm fully on board and I think it's a great way to, to see what's happening. The other thing that's interesting about social media and Twitter is that when you start publishing things in the open, it again leads to these like serendipitous encounters I was mentioning. So people will either message you or you have the chance to message them about some particular idea, which can lead to some interesting collaborations. And again, it's just like the sort of nice aspects of social media. I know there are many bad ones, but I think this is a particularly nice one. On that note, what is your Twitter handle? It's a super annoying one. It's underscore uh, Luton. So L-E-W-T-U-N. Okay. Um, right. But I think if you look up Lewis Tunstall, there's not many Lewis Tunstalls in the world. Lewis, it's been nice chatting with you. Thanks a lot, Richmond. Thank you for listening to this episode of Lewis Tunstall. Next week, we're going to be speaking with Jeremy Harris, one of the co-founders of Sharpest Mind, and also the host of Total's Data Science Podcast. And once again, thanks for listening and see you next week.